Yeah. Yeah. She saw her baby's image. She saw the ultrasound picture and it made her fully pro-life. So she was pro-life, but had, you know, wrestled with some of the exceptions, like a lot of Christians do, Mm -hmm. you know, you can talk to people and you can say, what if my daughter's raped or what if the baby has a fetal abnormality or what if my, my wife's, um, uh, health is at risk or something, you know, or her life. And so my book's especially good at that really helping even Christians and pastors understand what it means to be fully pro-life. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. My next guest is Laurie Hughes. She's the author of the book Choosing Zoe. Now, you guys know that out of all of the political issues of the day that we could talk about, the one that is uh, the closest to my heart, the one that is really a single issue voter kind of thing for me, I've I've become a single issue voter on this one for a number of reasons, which I've already explained. Uh, It is about abortion. And uh, this particular author, I'm going to go ahead and just go to her and let her tell you her story, but it is a fantastic story, and it is one that speaks to this issue of life that is so important to so many of us. So welcome to the program, Laurie Hughes. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Caleb. Well, it is fantastic to have you on, and uh, I would just like to go ahead and, and let you kind of intro yourself. I know a lot of hosts like to give a quick bio of the host or the, the guest. I like to just let you tell your own story, and I know that you're good at that. That's why you wrote this book in the first place. So just go ahead and give the audience an idea of of what inspired you to write this book, uh, your background, and and sort of give them an introduction to that. Sure. So, well, I was raised in uh, Billings, Montana, so we have quite different accents, you and I. We do indeed. (laughs) I was the youngest of eight kids, and I was raised uh, Catholic. We went to Catholic schools. And my father and mother were both very Mm. pro-life. I was in high school in the 70s when Roe v. Wade um, was brought into law. Right. um, Based on bad fetal development science. and Well, and also um, bad constitutionality, but I won't go off on that tangent. (laughs) A derivative right from a derivative right, but yeah. Definitely. And so you can imagine how scared I was. Um, to tell my parents while especially going to Catholic school um, that I was pregnant. And so I kind of did what any other responsible teenager would do. And uh, my mom had said, I'm going to tell dad on the way home from the airport that you're pregnant. And I got scared. So I called up my boyfriend. I was like, come pick me up. And we went and sat in the church parking lot because we kind of knew where to go. We were in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I kept hearing my dad's words saying every baby is a blessing because my dad definitely taught us that we're all created in God's image, you know, how significant we are. And um, so that just kind of kept rolling around in my mind, uh, knowing that every baby is a blessing. And that really gave me the uh, encouragement to go home. And so I'm walking up this like super long driveway. I'm 15 years old and I'm like praying to God that my dad's asleep. Mm-hmm. And I got to the door and I put my hand on that doorknob and I, I, I did the sign of the cross. I was, please God, let my dad be asleep. <laughs> and then the minute I opened up the door, there sits my dad, like always. He's sitting in his green velvet chair and he always wore these pop bottle glasses and mm-hmm. magnifiers and he was reading his Bible. And I just burst into tears. Mm-hmm. And my dad came over to me and he put his arms around me. And he said, I love you. Mom said that uh, you're going to have a baby. And all I ask is that you will pray every day what's best for your baby, whether you uh, raise her with our guidance or whether you place her in adoptive arms. And he gave me a little kiss on the forehead. So now get to get to sleep. You have school in a couple of hours. We weren't allowed to miss school. (laughs) Right. For anything, apparently. Or (laughs) no, for anything. My parents really lived out the gospel of life. Mm. They didn't just talk about it. They weren't just pro-life when it was convenient or not their child. Like they meant what they lived and they meant um, Mm. to follow what God says about the Bible. And many people now say, well, the Bible doesn't mention abortion, Uh, but there's so much in the Bible, you know, where it talks about child sacrifice and 
Um, and, and just knowing that, that we're all made unique and, you know, masterfully and, and fearfully, wonderfully made and in the image of God. I mean, that's, if that doesn't rock your world as far as uh, choosing life versus abortion, then really nothing will. Well, to the people and, that, that say that the scripture doesn't mention abortion, I mean, the scripture also doesn't mention firearms. That doesn't mean that it's okay to just shoot some random person on the street. Like that that's a, a very weak argument. Uh, the, the Bible does speak to that so much, but uh, really what I, I want to sort of zero in on based on what you said there, um, two things. First of all, the way that your, your parents handled it, I thought was, you know, admirable in the sense that yes, there is something that, that shouldn't have happened that happened uh, but ultimately, it seems like their first concern was for you and your child, and they already treated it like a child even back in this stage. And I think that, that it sounds like that was uh, something that was really important to you and, and left an impression on you. Absolutely. And, and I was afraid, I mentioned, walking up that long driveway, even though my parents weren't, they never laid a hand on me. Sure. I was still very fearful, and that's what leads young girls um, primarily to abortion clinics. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even with the the most celebrated unplanned pregnancy in the Bible, you know, with Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. Um, right, our... Gabriel had to come. Yeah, Gabriel had to come separately to both Mary and to Joseph. And the mm -hmm. first thing he said is, do not be afraid. And so I, I believe that the way we treat someone initially is how we address the fear and how we bring peace into the situation. And my parents, what they did is they took the focus, like you said, off of the situation off of the problem, so to speak, and they placed it on my welfare and the welfare of my unborn baby. Yeah, and I frankly, I think that was just a fantastic point to bring up the fact that uh, that was Gabriel's first thing that he said to both Mary and Joseph, and, and they were living in a time at which uh, you, you could literally be stoned to death for this. And so it was something that I really do think would, would speak to... Uh, you know, that sensibility. And, and I can't really relate to that. I'm not a dad. I've, I've never, uh, you know, been in that situation. And of course, I've never been in the situation of being pregnant, obviously, because regardless <laughs> of what people are saying today, I can't do that. I'm a guy. Uh, <laughs> no matter what I identify as, I still can't get pregnant. Uh, but anyway, so that that's kind of your origin story and, and where it all started for you. But uh, as I understand, that was... Uh, you know, just based on watching some of your interviews, that was not a one-time event either, that, that you actually had an unplanned pregnancy later on as well. Yes, um, I uh, didn't learn. So, uh, Caleb, most young ladies that are in uh, high school as teenagers or preteens that get pregnant, mm -hmm. the statistics are they'll be pregnant in about another year at about 50% of a rate. And so wow. that's whether they abort first, miscarry, um, carry out the pregnancy and place the baby for adoption or parent, um, they are pregnant again, 50% of the time. And it's rising, could even be higher now. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't learn my lesson, same boyfriend. Um, my parents, they weren't really versed in talking to me about my relationship. Um, they, they exemplified biblical morality, but they didn't really know how to talk to us kids even though you would think they should have, because I'd already, you know, me and my baby were living in their house. Right. And so um, I got pregnant again and again, like such a responsible teenager. I hid the pregnancy and uh, no one actually knew that I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And um, new girl came to town. She was from Chicago and uh, I caught her and my boyfriend rolling around in the park next to the school. And I got into like a serious altercation with him. I mean, I was fighting him two blocks you know, down the street. Right. And um, just so stressed out. And I got home and I was really heartbroken. And uh, my little girl, I uh, was putting her to bed about seven o'clock. And, um, you know, she was kind of patting my face. Um, and just kind of, I felt like I was kind of coming back to life a little bit, you know, because I was really numb. Mm. And then I put her to bed. And um, that night I didn't feel very good. And I started uh, having really bad labor pains in the middle of the night. And so I went into the bathroom and um, I, I delivered a little boy. Um, he was 22 weeks, um, which is viable. You know, babies yeah. 21, 22 weeks live outside of the womb now. And mm -hmm. um, so 
I just was totally in tears. Um, my mom, I was trying to call out to my mom, but I didn't wait and wake up my baby girl or my dad. And so when my baby girl woke up about 6.30 in the morning, I was still in the bathroom and um, my mom heard her squawk for her bottle. Mm. And so then she heard me crying and, and she came in to the bathroom and she's like, what's the matter? Are you okay? And then she said, oh, are you, are you pregnant again? <laughs> and I just said, not anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, she asked me if I could get up and the baby was still uh, attached to the umbilical cord and I hadn't delivered the placenta yet. And mm -hmm. so um, my mom took him and she told me to put a pad on and go to bed and she'd take me to the doctor in the morning that she was going to go take care of the baby. And, um, you know, I put my hand on that doorknob as well going into my bedroom and there was those little plaques and it said, Lori's room and it was a little pink princess and I remember like thinking to myself like I'm I'm no princess and I went to bed and I put those yellow flowered sheets over my head and I really felt like I just kind of covered up all my shame and my postpartum loss mm -hmm. um, I wasn't introduced to that you know I barely knew anyone that had died before and then to see that um you know, was really, really hard. And I, I buried that memory for probably 25 years, mm -hmm. which is normal, you know, at home and in the churches. Um, even if we're married, a lot of times the, the women or the wife, the mothers, they won't, um, they won't get the proper healing afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe if the baby was born and stillborn, because more people are horrified, um, you know, mm -hmm. by that, rightly so. Um, right. But when I teach fetal development in the schools, um, this little baby here mm -hmm. is um, 22 weeks. And this is the size um, that my little boy was, you know, fully formed. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about late term abortion, uh, for any reason, you know, we're talking about this size all the way up um, to birth. And Right. Like, I'll, I'll never forget my little boy was just like a fully formed human, you know, and to yeah. think that nowadays he could have lived maybe outside of the womb, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just incredible. And, you know, I'll never forget, like his, his little hands and feet sprung out. And I remember thinking like, he'll never throw a ball, you know, real athletic in our family. Uh, he'll never walk. Um, but, you know, he had purpose in my life. Because he really drove me when you're that hurt. No one really knows what you're going through. And I'm Irish twins, you know, not even a year apart. And I'm going back to school and no one knows the pain and suffering that I'm going through. Um, my mom didn't tell my dad at the time. She wanted me to, um, you know, get through the school year. Um, and she was in shock too. I think about what I did to my mother, you know, putting her in that situation. Certainly. And she's the one that had to take care of the baby. Um, but really it, um, you know, it wasn't the teenage pregnancy crisis of giving birth and enjoying a beautiful baby girl that was just so happy or losing the little boy. It was the um, poor relationship with my boyfriend that had me really heartbroken because you're really not young enough and this is why I love going into schools, talking to high school kids, because you're, you're not young, you're too young to navigate, you know, love, um, being a mom, having sex outside of marriage. Uh, it's just, it's really outside of God's plan. And that heartache really drove me to accepting Christ as my personal savior. Mm -hmm. um, he was the one that was there, the Holy Spirit, like to comfort me and to encourage me. When I was alone at night, um, you never know what someone's going through. You know, I'd walk down the halls at school and kids never knew what I was going through. And even in the high school, they didn't even know I'd kept my first baby. I was uh, wow. sewing in home ec class one day and I was sewing a, a little uh, knit jersey t-shirt and some little corduroy pants. And the nun came up to check on my project and she was like, um, oh, that's nice. Like, who are you sewing this for? You know, like a niece mm -hmm. or... Um, and everyone knew our family, um, you know, all eight of us kids had gone there. And my brother was actually one of the teachers, one of the only lay teachers at the time. And I said, no, this is for my baby girl. And it wasn't within maybe two days when they had a, a board meeting and 
some other moms came and said I wasn't a good example to stay at the school. And so I was kind of uh, politely asked to leave my parochial school, the only school I ever knew, mm. you know, same kids since first grade. And then I had to go to a big, scary high school where, where my boyfriend went and all the girls he chased after. And so, and by the um, way, I can relate to that because I went to the same school K through 12 my entire career. So, so the, the big, scary public school that I went to it was, so big I couldn't even get from class to class you know trying to navigate that campus mm -hmm. and uh, my boyfriend went to school there and uh, you know he was um, prom king and played a lot of sports and uh, the girls he liked were also there um, and one of the girls she used to just give me so much heck like she would follow me bumper to bumper to my babysitter after school um, kind of you know scaring me that they knew where my baby was at and she was just really horrible. Like back in the seventies, that saying came out um, that said, today is the first day uh, of the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And her and her friends would like serial killers would, would cut out um, letters out of newspapers and they would put things on my locker. Like they said, today is the last day of the rest of your life. And then they would um, come to my house and they would, uh, be rude to my mom and throw eggs at the house and come to the door asking for me. And my mom would say like, why are you fighting over your both beautiful girls? Like, why are you fighting over this boy? And then um, my mom said, well, praise the Lord. Cause that was the seventies, right? When everyone said, praise the Lord for all mm -hmm. good and all bad. And um, you know, my parents were going to some full gospel meetings and women's aglow and uh, they were um, born again believers and, um, charismatic Catholics at first. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I would go back to the school and then these girls would come into my classroom when the teacher was speaking, which would have never happened in my Catholic school. Right. And they would start hollering at me, calling names. And then they would walk down the hall going, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And see guys just, just beat each other up. We're a lot better <laughs> at that. Uh, we got to that. We got to that. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I was, yeah, <laughs> just trying to lighten awful. the mood, but yeah, that it, it was awful. So you know, it's you you think of the drama. The same drama goes on today. You know, I'll be in does, yeah. pregnancy clinic with young girls in high school, and they're going through the same drama. You know, the boys just using them for sex, or not really in love, or caring about her, and um, you know, and then she's in this crisis pregnancy, and um, it's still number one, uh, the boy that will coerce or uh, suggest for the, the girlfriend to go have an abortion. Um, sadly, moms are not far behind. We have a whole lot of post-abortive women um, since Roe v. Wade who are mothers now. And even though they were harmed by abortion and hurt, they'll say like, you know, you, you have your whole life ahead of you. You're not going to have this boy's child. And they will um, take their own daughter to the pregnancy clinic. Um, the last young lady that I talked to she said she was uh, throwing up in the toilet and her mom mm. came and just grabbed her hair out of the toilet and said, you know, come on. And she took her down to Planned Parenthood um, and they did an abortion the very next day. And she was telling her at, when after she had the abortion, she was crying. And her mom said to her, um, let me get this right. <laughs> her mom said, oh, at least it wasn't as bad as when I had to do it. Like abortion had improved or something yeah. and so her mom had yeah. had a rough go but also wasn't willing to support her daughter uh, with an unplanned pregnancy so there we got a lot of training parents uh, to mm. do and and one of my favorite things in the book is teaching parents to be able to talk to their children about their bodies and about sexuality from the time they're little and that way it's age appropriate mm. and you're not just having some weird uncomfortable conversation when they're a teenager they may have already had Facts and you're going in there and saying, um, do you know about, uh, you know, right. how and babies are made or something? It's like so awkward and it's so late. Really need to mm -hmm. have those conversations um, before junior high, um, especially in 25 states now. Girls can have abortions uh, without their parents' consent or even knowledge. And so we really need to have those uh, conversations. You know, it's mm -hmm. illegal for a 12 year old to have sex, but it is legal. Uh, for them to go in and have an abortion and, and parents never know. And mm. even then there's laws in 
the 25 states where the school district is involved. So you just, uh, the young girl can just go into her principal or tell a teacher or the, or the nurse and she can leave to have an abortion. And then the school cannot tell you your son or daughter was not there. Like normally I have five kids. If someone was to miss school, I'd get a call. Right. Even if I'd already called and said we had a doctor appointment, I would get a call and it would say like, Jeffrey missed one or two more periods today. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the sense of that you going in for birth control and abortion, uh, the school can't even tell you that they were not there. You know, and, and I think that speaking as somebody, I mean, I know Montana is a red state as well, uh, but you live in California now, correct? Yes, I do. Right. See, a lot of people in red states, they, I think, kind of get this false sense of security and complacency when it comes to that because they think, oh, well, you know, we're, we're in a pro-life state. I mean, Alabama is literally the only state on the books now that actually says abortion is illegal. Now, because of the federal law, that doesn't really take effect. But um, they, they think because of that, they're immune to this stuff. And I tell them all the time, I was like, look, right here in Montgomery, Alabama, in this city, we uncovered a case uh, about a year and a half ago of a 13-year-old girl who her rapist was taking her to Planned Parenthood and getting two yes. abortions for her within the span of a year to cover up the fact that he was raping her. I mean, this stuff happens everywhere. And so yes. just because it's a red state, don't think that these things can't happen to your kids. Absolutely. And that's a perfect case is like, you know, a, a predator of rape or even when uh, someone traffics, mm -hmm. you know, the girls. Um, Planned Parenthood has been caught. There's, you know, several different cases where they've been caught, where they have not identified that the um, that the person was older, and in that fashion, they have also aided and abetted to some trafficking instances, and mm -hmm. that's really huge in the news right now. But you know, when when they talk about women's health, I, I think one thing we can agree on is that a 12 year old, 13 year old, you know, they're not women. No. So it has nothing to do with healthcare, but even if I can talk to moms about, you know, that they're not a woman yet, mm -hmm. that these choices are um, too tough to navigate and they are taken advantage of and they're with wrong kind of guys and, and older guys seek prey, especially in single parent homes, you know, as predators going after underage girls, um, they'll a lot of times have a soft target. They'll target, uh, child of a single mom, so to speak, mm. because the uh, parental guidance isn't there at home sometimes. Mm. Um, and as far as protection of the of the child, so not really a parental guidance, but mm. um, just the protection is looking there. And so predators will often find a soft target. And that's what they call a soft target. Mm. Um, that could be even at your church, or that could be through the Girl Scouts or it could be through the wrestling coach, um, but it's also just older guys in town um, that are, you know, more predator types. And so when they get somebody pregnant, um, even sometimes they'll go through the mom, which is like the gatekeeper, mm -hmm. because they'll say, oh, like, I'm going to teach your, uh, I'm going to tutor your daughter in math, or, you know, I'm going to help her um, with softball or, and so they gain the trust of the parent. And so they're more easily um, able to get to the young girl. Mm. And it's amazing how you can manipulate, you know, a young person. And so whether it's a predator and they end up, you know, raping the girl and taking her to Planned Parenthood or whether it's a trafficker taking somebody to Planned Parenthood. Um, like I said before, Planned Parenthood has been caught um, in and abetting those type of crimes. Just, you right. know, covering up the, the sexual predator crime and adding a... a the abuse of it, it's terrible uh, i'm right. a mandated reporter mm -hmm. and <laughs> more often than not they just don't ask any questions but you're right there have been several cases where they actually help cover that kind of thing up which um you know mm -hmm. horrible and callous as this is that's their business they make money off yeah. of that so they, they do have a, a financial incentive to do that uh one thing that i wanted to address though that kind of plays off something that you said a few minutes ago uh, about how uh, in, in your personal story and then also just in general uh, with with your boyfriend that this is the the kind of guy that was not interested in, in helping out with the the child once it came and uh, uh, you know how horrible he was and then also talking about some of these predator types 
uh, constantly, especially as a, a man that's pro-life, we're often told and sort of badgered by, well, you're not allowed to have an opinion because you're a man and you can't possibly relate to this and this isn't really your place to speak on this. And one thing that I get agitated about is the most pro-choice people, the most pro-abortion men, are men like that. Because abortion gives them an out. It gives them a freedom from the responsibility of that. And like you said, normally it's the boyfriend that is the one that tries to convince the girl and, and talk her into abortion, even if she doesn't want to. And so um, if you could just sort of, I mean, is am I on the right track here? Because typically the pro-abortion men that I find are the worst kinds of men that don't care about the girls. Yeah, and that's why it's so important to, you know, teach sons um, how valuable young ladies are and how valuable um children are, mm -hmm. um, and to get more, more guys involved in the situation, uh, even at church, um, to, to empower men to know that this is like 50% of their child. They absolutely have as much right to that child. Um, you can have a law, but it doesn't mean it's uh, moral or it's a good thing, or it came from God. That's the second statement that Gabriel said to Joseph was to marry Mary and to be a father to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's what men need to tell men is that it is their responsibility. So we start there where men are um, back in the conversation as far as being men and being providers and protectors of the women and having their children. But also then that uh, when men are in this situation, that other people in the church come by them and, you know, help them mentor them into fatherhood. Uh, we have some young guys that come into the pregnancy clinic. And they can go through some of the parenting classes. And it's always awesome. They want to learn. And every school that I go into, when I ask the guys, um, you know, do they want to, uh, you know, have one wife parent their children? They all say yes. Mm -hmm. And many of them are from broken homes, but they want it. So they just need, they just need some guidance. Um, but we need yeah. men. We badly need men in the pro-life movement. And we need men that will speak up and cherish life, but also protect the young girls and protect the, the women in general. Um, we, we need them. You know, if it wasn't for well, my father, my situation might not have turned out so well. Mm -hmm. And my boyfriend, you know, he didn't have a dad. He, he didn't learn those types of things. Um, he, he loved my daughter. We went over there all the time, you know, with his mom and sister. Mm -hmm. He just didn't have the skills or the... Um, you know, the role model. It's very important um, to be a role model, especially to to young men that are raised in single parent homes. We have a, a real problem. Uh, we need more dads. We need more dads like mine. Um, and guys want it. They yeah. really want to do the right thing. G generally speaking, so, that's true. And, you know, what, what you said there is so important because uh, when it comes to I think that this is sort of a side effect of two things. First of all, it's a side effect of us decoupling sex and responsibility because they're, you know, th that's what the marriage contract is, isn't it? It's saying that, okay, I'm engaging in a contract that I'm going to love and protect this person as my partner. And then also you get to enjoy some of the benefits that come along with that. But we, we've sort of decoupled that. And frankly, I think it's a, a, a horribly sadistic ploy the one that worked out really well for terrible men is that somehow they convinced women that uh, having sex without any responsibility is empowering somehow. I don't get how they made that sales pitch, but you know, somehow they, they pulled that off to where uh, a lot of modern feminists think, yeah, having sex with a lot of guys with no responsibility or no benefits beyond that is, is a positive thing. I don't know how they, they got to that point. Um, yeah, it's so selfish and they have everything to gain because if they pay for an abortion, then they don't have to pay for child support for 18 years. Right. You know, um, so for them, it's like, let's just uh, have everything selfish and then just kind of cover up the crime. And a lot of times women will go have the abortion because to save the boyfriend and girlfriend relationship, mm -hmm. but the, the, the pain that she goes through and she doesn't get the support from the man that coerced her into the abortion and they end up breaking up anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's not a win-win for the, no. for the woman that. No, certainly not. And uh, one thing that I, I wanted to ask about, because now you've probably picked up on this in, in our conversation, I'm very much a, a, 
a philosopher. Like I can handle things on a moral level. I can talk through it, the talking points and, and give you a, a you know detailed presentation as to why abortion is immoral and all of that. And that's all good. And I think that that's needed. But the pro-life movement in general struggles with emotional appeal. And we've just never been as good at that as the other side. And so, uh, you know, very early on when before Roe v. Wade happened and all of that, uh, the pro-life argument, I think, somewhat fell on deaf ears when all of a sudden the pro-abortion people started uh, painting it as women's health and protecting women. And we just never really figured out a good answer to that. Uh, I mean, I, I, obviously on the moral side, we do. But, you know, we, we struggle with that emotional appeal. And so uh, is that something that your book really sort of hits at? And, and if so, how can how can people that are advocates of life, how can we do a better job on that front? Right. Um, by sharing conversations and by being loving, uh, then we're very attractive. So like anything, if you point at two sides, then it's ad adversarial. Mm -hmm. If you have an enemy, it's going to always be adversarial. So when you think to yourself that pro-choice people might not be educated, then you can go from there. And then you go share your own stories. Um, I can share mine and I can come off in a very loving way. Um, also, I lead a post abortive ministry at my church called mm -hmm. the Movement of Love. So I'm always in the back of my mind. I know that when I talk to someone who's pro-choice and uh, maybe uh, confrontational, then there could be hurt under there from their own abortion. And so you, you need to have uh, gingerly talk, um, kind words and um, empathy towards someone. And when you ask a lot of questions, it's very good tool to ask That's questions. something Jesus did a lot. Yeah, yeah. And when you ask questions, you're gonna see where this is coming from. You're gonna see if they even have any, um, any, any proof or scientific proof, they might not know anything. They could just be regurgitating rhetoric um, that they're hearing from that camp. And mm -hmm. so it's really important to share our stories, to be open and to, um, to in conversation, just to be really loving. And when you do that, uh, you disarm uh, all of the negativity and you're really able to celebrate. And so when you talk about women's health, well, abortion is not better than giving birth. It's, mm. it's worse for a woman. Um, and we have, you know, women that have trouble conceiving after or carrying their babies to term, you know, more miscarriages. And so when mm. you just look into just the medical proof, it's not healthy for women. It's also not healthy for um, their emotions. And so um, pro-choice people will use a lot of emotion but we don't make sound decisions out of emotion. If we did, fear would drive us all to the abortion clinic. Right. And so what we have to do is uh, address those fears, but ask what's going on with people. And if you can get someone to, uh, to calm their emotions down, then there could be more reasoning that happens. Mm -hmm. And you can teach them about fetal development. You can find out if a young person, so to speak, um, needs help with uh, rent or, um, or food or school. Um, when you listen, and whether you're listening to a young person that's pregnant and is um, looking at all of her options, or whether you're looking at a pro-choice person, they all have their own experiences. And what you do is you listen to them, then you're able to um, find some commonalities and, um, and, and get to the truth. But it's, it's very, very back to the emotional ploy that they had. Um, we can show our emotions too. And good emotions always uh, are going to outlive the bad. When you scroll on Facebook, you know, and someone's like, I have cancer, someone died, you know, you'll, you'll get some responses. But when you say like, happy birthday, or you do a gender reveal and having a baby girl, like everyone comments on it mm -hmm. because it's so attractive. And so giving birth is attractive, but being introduced to motherhood. Um, yesterday, all over Twitter, it was Candace Owens, you know, because she's pregnant. She oh, I actually her. didn't know that. This is the first time yeah. hearing. Yeah. Yeah. She saw her baby's image. She saw the ultrasound picture and it made her fully pro-life. So she was pro-life, but had, you know, wrestled with some of the exceptions like 
a lot of Christians do. Mm-hmm. You know, you can talk to people and you can say, what if my daughter's raped? Or what if the baby has a fetal abnormality? Or what if my my wife's um, uh, health is at risk or something, you sure. know, or her life? And so my book's especially good at that, mm-hmm. really helping even Christians and pastors understand what it means to be fully pro-life. And for Candace, it was seeing her, um, you know, little embryos image on the uh, ultrasound and 90% of women will choose life once they've seen the ultrasound picture with the heartbeat and the little, you know, shape of the baby and little legs and feet kicking around. And um, so she was very candid, so to speak, that she had some reservations, but is now 100% fully pro-life. And I just thought that was, you know, so exciting because there's nothing like becoming a mom or becoming a dad or becoming a grandparent. There's just nothing like it. And when we share our powerful stories of adoption Mm -hmm. or if we become a foster mom, um, whatever it is, when we share those stories, it's attractive. Mm. That's what really hurts the Mm pro-choice camp is all the stories. Um, they, They can't deny fetal development anymore. They don't even try to say, you know, that it's not a big, Maybe they just say it's like not wanted, like it doesn't matter. I can do what I want. So they are still wrong scientifically. And I think that a lot of young people and people in high school and college that say it's my body, my choice. um, They're just repeating rhetoric because scientifically everybody knows it's a unique person with a different blood type. Um, And so they can't really say it's not a baby, but now they say, well, it's my right. It's my choice. It's unwanted. I don't want it. I'll have babies later. And, right. you know, that's that's what we need to really speak to is uh, the wantonness of the child and come around the young lady and let her know how we can, you know, be a part of aiding her and helping her. There's lots and lots of uh, people that will come by her side and you'll hear people on the pro-choice camp saying, well, um, you know, you only care about people when they're in the womb. And that's just like ridiculous. Um, we are by far the ones that do adopt and mm. become foster parents. And yeah, I mean, the, the vast majority, I actually did a study on that uh, not too long ago. The vast majority of like adoption agencies, foster homes, orphanages, they're Christian funded. And so yeah. the, the idea that we're anti-kid is just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was four to one, like uh, yeah. Christian charity versus all other charities and government. So. Uh, I mean, that's absolutely true, and, and people just don't know that or don't see that side of it, and so it's really important to shed light on that. Um, one thing that I, I do think that this does a world of good on, because there's, I know it's a tired old argument, I know it's not true, but it gets pushed out there as though it is truth, and a lot of people buy into it, uh, that all pro-lifers are just a bunch of uh, old white religious men that are trying to push right. their beliefs on everybody else, and so... Uh, having these kinds of real stories, it, it does put an an actual person, a face on it. And I think that that's a, a big difference. So if somebody is interested in sharing these stories and, and even sharing your story with them and, and wants to get your book and, and do that, where would they go to do that? Uh, well, you can get my book at uh, Amazon.com. It's probably the easiest way. And um, the title of the book is Choose Zoe, Z-O-E. Mm-hmm. Um and Zoe is the Greek word for life in John 10, 10, where it says that Jesus came to give us life more abundantly, mm. because to me, pro-life is also pro-eternal life. And when someone's struggling with pro-life, um, it's a grand opportunity to disciple them. Mm. And uh, the, the tagline is, um, well, here's, here's the book here. Oh, good. We get to see it. And it's uh, Choose Zoe, a story of unplanned uh, parenthood and the case for life. And I chose unplanned parenthood because it's about the parenting. You know, pregnancy is only nine months Mm -hmm. and it's uh, definitely, you know, more than that. Uh, So we need to focus on the the, the whole life of of being a parent and everything. Uh, I also have a a Mm choosezoe.com and uh, there's an email there where you can reach out back and forth. I love to talk to people. Um, Many times after a talk like this, it always is really cool because a lot of men will reach out to me. (laughs) <laughs> because they'll want to talk for the first time about um, 
having having their old girlfriend go in and have an abortion or something or mm -hmm. they'll tell me i wasn't there for my wife when i was miscarrying because i was going through my own pain and she thought i wasn't but we weren't you know helping each other because many many ma marriages will break up after mm -hmm. a miscarriage or loss of even a toddler mm -hmm. uh, because they're both grieving and um, they don't understand that they grieve differently so you know men will want to talk about pregnancy loss primarily and then, you know, young girls will call me sometimes and, you know, tell me, you know, that they were, they were raped. And um, one girl reached out to me and she said, um, you know, she was, she was raped by her own father and um, ostracized by the family. And then her dad um, went to uh, prison. Right. And she didn't know what to do. And so she was going to church. So the pastors um, adopted her little boy. And then she was able to continue school. And on Sunday, she would get to go and, and see him at school. And it was just a really, really beautiful, you know, win-win uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And when we were talking, she told me that she wanted to take her life when she found out that she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And that the baby growing inside of her gave her a reason to live and actually saved her life. And all the other girls that I know that were raped and chose abortion, they all say they had like two traumas, like, mm -hmm. you know, double trouble. And the, the ones that I know that I've spoke to over the years have all said the same thing that um, they felt really good, whether they parented or maybe they even miscarried or um, placed the baby for adoption, that it was a healing time for them mm -hmm. um, while pregnant because they could get the focus off of their own life and they were doing something you know important with the child mm. and you know even in the pregnancy clinic um and we talked earlier about underage girls and the, my whole purpose for writing choose zoe we had three 12 year olds pregnant in my town here in california within one month mm. and when i met with the third girl um at the pregnancy clinic and you know i i told her i was also pregnant as a teenager. I understood her fears. Uh, we talked about uh, her positive pregnancy test, the development of her little growing, um, you know, embryo at the time. And um, she was able to talk about the bad relationship with her boyfriend and how would she tell her parents. And uh, then we prayed and something quite miraculous happened because prayer is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And she kind of braced herself for me to call the authorities. Um, I was really strong going through that with her, wanting to make sure that she was okay and getting all the help that we could give. Mm. And then I just went home that night and I just cried out to God, you know, cause I was 15 and I had good sure. parents and yeah. it's like, these little girls are 12. Like I had a banana seat bike when I was 12. Um, I just got a right. trainer bra and I mean, just a little kid. And I went home and I just cried out to God, like, how can I help? And in the middle of the night, it was like 3.30 in the morning, I felt this nudging, like, get up, right, educate my people. And I, I've never even written an article. And so I began to write, and I wrote on pregnancy and pregnancy loss, everything I knew about the um, pro-life uh, organizations and how we could connect. And I put every resource I could, I could find um, is in the book. And it's, um, it's, it's been a real, a real joy. I, I teach a lot of uh, sanctity human life. I go out to churches during that time and, um, and speak on that. And so it's, it's just really important. Um, pastors, leaders, parents, they all need um, the education and, and they may need healing. You know, many times the parent needs healing before they're able to openly discuss this with their own uh, children. But, um, you know, these, these young girls, it was like a real pivotal, a pivotal change in my life. And, you know, to, to think that I was such a young girl mm. and um, I'm fighting for these underage girls, you know, every day, whether it's by putting my arm around one of them and walking them through the situation or whether it's at school and I'm trying to prevent it with the young boys and girls. Mm. Um, and, you know, during this whole process, I get told by one of my own daughters um, that she had a secret abortion when she was young. Wow. And I didn't know this. And so she'd struggled for decades um, with her own, you know, problems. 
and she's in a lot of recovery with Celebrate Recovery uh, as a leader. I mean, my daughter's like a with it kind of girl. She has her master's, like she's this amazing human being. She talks way more uh, education, educated than I do. And um, she's just doing like really big things for the community. She also works in mental health. And um, a couple of years, she was the um, director at our pregnancy clinic in Napa, California. And she's just an amazing human being, but she couldn't hide the secret abortion that she'd had. And so she shared it with me and I was just in a fetal position. I had no yeah. idea that you could grieve an aborted grandchild, just like you would grieve like someone who was living and died, you know, cause the, the baby is living and right. the baby's future was lost. Like I want that grandchild. Sure. I have 11 of them. I, I want that wow. one. <laughs> 11. And, and I love kids. And so, you know, my first thing that I said to her was, I'm so sorry. And I'm so sorry that you went through this mm. because I would have never suggested this for my daughter, sure. like other parents do. I also would never want to know that any of my kids went and had a surgery with nobody there for them and totally unassisted. You know, mm. so um, I was grieving what my daughter went through and grieving the loss of her baby, my grandchild. Um, but the way God works and the way he redeems our life, uh, her and I right now, along with um, our pastor, Joan, our pastor's wife, uh, we're writing post abortive curriculum mm. for churches uh, together, the three of us. And um, my daughter's also on leadership with the post-abortive ministry. And she's very vocal. She'll talk about it. And like I said, you know, she's articulate. She's beautiful. She's lived it. And um, she's definitely changing lives. Uh, it's really exciting. And, you know, my kids are part black also. And so um, that speaks to the old, old white man theory. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, yeah. I also have a, yeah, I have a daughter with like, big curls and she's with um, pro-life San Francisco who does amazing things um, even with Democrats for life. They're, they're really teaming up on, you know, let's, this is the, the gravest injustice of our time abortion and let's, you know, let's collectively do what we can uh, to save lives. Well, I tell and, you I, just personally, I'd really love for my congregation to get some of the material that's designed for churches from you. So I may actually ask you about that a little bit later. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I think that one thing you said is just so, so important, and especially with sharing the, the experience with your own daughter, is that I think one of the biggest draws for the pro-life movement is that we see, rightfully so, I'm not saying that this is an incorrect uh, perception here, but we see these babies as these defenseless, fragile little things that need protection, which is correct. But sometimes we forget that the girls involved in them are also fragile little things that also need protecting. Yeah. And so it's, it's a, a losing battle to come at them uh, in a way that doesn't keep that in mind. Um, and, and I think that you've sort of articulated that very well, but th that's all the time that I've got. Thank you so much for being on here and, and being generous with your time. It has been a real pleasure. Laurie Hughes, author of Choose Joey, uh, Choose Zoe. <laughs> Choose Zoe. Uh, you can pick that up, uh, you know, wherever books are sold, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, also choosezoe.com. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you too, Caleb. I really appreciate it. And, you know, my book was censored and labeled uh, political by Facebook and Instagram. And they shut my publisher's accounts down for over a year and a half. So I've, um, I've been just really out there trying to spread the word since I got denied a platform and the ability mm. to purchase ads and uh, censorship is real. Yeah. So I really appreciate you, um, giving me, you know, this opportunity, uh, to be on air and speak to the people in Alabama. So hopefully I'll be able to come see you all sometime and enjoy some of that Southern hospitality. Well, if you ever are uh, here in town, feel free to come by. We'll have you in for another interview and I'll take you to get some biscuits and gravy or some barbecue or some, some authentic Southern go. food. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and if I ever come your way, I expect to get some really good pizza. So, <laughs> Absolutely. I know some places. Some, some of that California pizza. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, Laurie. I appreciate it. Thank you, Caleb. God bless. God bless Bye, you everyone. Too. All right. We'll be back in just a minute on Tactics.
It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them, I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter, and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.